Good evening to all in the Asia Pacific. Good afternoon to those joining us from Europe and the Middle East. And a very good morning to those in the Americas. A warm welcome to this launch of the 2021 Asia Pacific Regional Security Assessment. My name is Lynn Kwok, and I'm Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific Security. Together with the former Executive Director of the IISS Asia Office, Dr. Tim Huxley, I am editor of the Asia Pacific Regional Security Assessment. I'll also be your chair for this session. The Asia Pacific Regional Security Assessment examines key regional security issues relevant to the policy-focused discussions at the IISS Shangri-La Dialogue, an annual defense summit the Institute convenes. The dossier is published each year in association with the dialogue. And although the dialogue had to be canceled this year, Tim and I, as well as the new executive director of our Asia office, James Crabtree, hope that the regional security assessment will nevertheless continue to promote debate among key decision makers and thinkers in the region. Many of you would have been guests at the dialogue and are joining us today. We thank you for your continued support of the IISS Shangri-La Dialogue process, and I'm so happy to see that we have many friends of the IISS online today. Now, this eighth volume of the Asia-Pacific Regional Security Assessment includes 12 chapters on diverse themes. You'll be hearing from some of the authors later, but as in previous years, this year's Regional Security Assessment includes not just in-depth analysis of some of the most pressing challenges uh, to security in the Asia-Pacific, but a wealth of data in graphical form. This is a map from Kanti Bajpai's chapter on India's emerging grand strategy, showing the locale of confrontations between India and China in 2020. This map from Franz Stefan Gedi's chapter on emerging technologies and future conflict in the Asia Pacific shows the range of Taiwanese medium and long range air defense systems. And for those of you wondering about the UK's commitment to the Indo-Pacific and persistence of Royal Naval warships, Alessio Patalano's chapter on the United Kingdom and Indo-Pacific security shows deployments of Her Majesty's ships to the Indo-Pacific from January 2018 to October 2020. Now, I'm delighted that a number of authors who wrote chapters for the Regional Security Assessment are with us for this launch. Amidst great power rivalry, a new US administration, and increasing interest from powers beyond the region, it's a particularly opportune time to be having this discussion. Now, I propose we proceed as follows. I'll engage speakers in a moderated discussion for about half the session, and we'll then turn to Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question, and I hope many of you will, please type your question on the Q&A button at box at the bottom right hand of your screen. Please let us know to whom your question is addressed, as well as your affiliation. It's with great pleasure that I now turn to introducing my speakers. Now, joining us virtually are Ashley Townsend, uh, Director of Foreign Policy and Defense at the United States Studies Center at the University of Sydney. Welcome, Ashley. And from the research staff of the Institute, Robert Ward, Japan Chair and Director of Geoeconomics and Strategy, as well as Sarah Rain, Consulting Senior Fellow for Geopolitics and Strategy. Welcome. Now, with me in this room, uh, Dr. Kanti Bajpai, who's directly to my right. Um, Kanti is Wilma Professor of Asian Studies at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. And we also have Drew Thompson joining us on my far right. He's visiting senior research fellow, also at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Thank you both for joining me in person. Drew, let's start with you. Your chapter examined US-China decoupling and its security implications for Southeast Asia. How does decoupling or disengaging fit into the broader concerns about the US and China clashing? And where do you expect the traje trajectory of US-China relations to go? Certainly. Thank you, Lynn. Um, decoupling was certainly a, a, a buzzword in 2020, uh, but I think it's, it's a very problematic concept. Uh, neither the US nor China uh, embraced it as a declared objective. Uh, and China certainly used the term pejoratively uh, accusing the United States of seeking to pursue decoupling, even as China pursued uh, many similar policies 
uh, and engaged in, in behavior that one could consider to be decoupling. So it, decoupling as a concept lacks a commonly understood uh, definition. So in the words of a former US Chief Justice, we don't really have a good definition for it, but I know it when I see it. Um, so I would describe China's objective as really not so much decoupling, but, um, and it's not simply as, as, as natural as, as, say, achieving self-reliance, which is, has been a stated policy for China in the past. But Beijing also knows that achieving uh, absolute objectives, such as decoupling, is really not necessarily in its interest, because it would be costly, but also it would not be able to accrue some of the benefits from engagement, uh, such as access to capital and technology. So, so there's still benefits for China to gain from it, even as it seeks to pursue uh, an objective that I would call fortification, where basically their effort is to build autonomy and resilience uh, against external threats. So that, so that notion of uh, fortification is really integral to, to Beijing's industrial policies, and it's increasingly central to the political society where Xi Jinping has sought to place the uh, Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, in the very dominant social, political, and economic uh, force in the country. And that really pushes non-party interests uh, as well as external interests to the margins of China. So the Trump administration also in 2020, uh, they took very significant steps to confront China in areas where it felt that the bilateral relationship was not advantageous to the United States or where they sought to protect themselves from predation or the risk of, of coercion. So, so that effort on the part of the United States was also um, very much an all of government effort uh, to approach competition, much as China does. And it's really based on a principle of achieving resiliency and diversification. And on the Trump administration's part, it really involved empowering the departments of treasury and commerce uh, to both scrutinize inbound investments as well as uh, external flows of technology. The Department of Justice was also heavily involved in uh, com uh, combating intellectual property theft and espionage. So Washington furthermore also took significant steps to address uh, military civil fusion by naming and identifying uh, military linked companies and then cutting them off from access to US capital. So all of those moves could be considered or interpreted as part of an effort to decouple, but neither country really identified their actions as an act of decoupling. Because really decoupling like engagement is, is more of the the means rather than the ends to a policy. So regarding Lynn, your question on, uh, res on the trajectory of decoupling, I think it's, it's pretty obvious that um, uh, Xi Jinping's overall approach to governance uh, and his acute perception of external threats to the party uh, very much makes the increase in integration with the, uh, the, the West, the United States, uh, uh, very difficult to conceive of. The Biden administration has also very much embraced uh, many of the policies that it inherited from uh, the Trump administration, and it's very committed to compete with China as they define it, and, and President Biden's also backed by a bipartisan concession primarily on Capitol Hill. So I think the Biden administration also enacted some early efforts to establish a what they called results-oriented uh, engagement with Beijing, uh, but they were met with very frosty and defensive interlocutors that indicated that Beijing wasn't willing to compromise or find common ground with the United States, or even acknowledge the U.S.'s degree of dissatisfaction with the lack of reciprocity in the bilateral relationship. So Kurt Campbell declared in May that the period that was broadly described as engagement has come to an end. And, and I think that pretty much sums up what the trajectory of U.S.-China decoupling will be. So it looks like it's going to be more uh, difficulties um, ahead in the US-China relationship. And of course, this poses problems for smaller countries in the region who have urged the United States and China not to ask them to choose. You touched on this on your chapter. But even for larger countries like Japan, I think what struck me about your chapter, Robert, was that you highlight in your chapter that US-China rivalry is making it very complicated for Japan, complicated for Japan to reconcile the importance of China's market um, to the Japanese economy with its critical security ties with the United States. That said, I think um, more than anyone else, the challenge for Japan um, 
is not just about the dilemma that uh, US-China rivalry uh, puts Japan in, but also China's actions in the region. Uh, could you tell me how China's actions in the region are catalyzing Japanese security policy, Robert? Well, first, uh, congratulations to you, Lynn, and the team on a fantastic uh, output, a fantastic book, uh, some great scholarship in it. I, I sort of heartily recommend it to all those who are listening. Uh, and thank you for having me on this great panel as well. Uh, good to hear some sober analysis from Drew on decoupling too, because the debate around decoupling is often far too shrill, so it's good to see some realism there. Um, as you said, uh, China is, uh, has been the major catalyst for um, changes, really quite significant changes to Japan's security and foreign policy, uh, as I argue in my piece. It's not the only catalyst, uh, of course. Others include developments in the US, which is obviously very important Japan, uh, as well as Abe Shinzo, the, the previous Prime Minister, his ideological aims after his return as Prime Minister in 2012. Um, importantly as well, this rethink predates uh, Abe. Uh, there are many triggers for, um, for the rethink in Japan on China before Abe, including uh, China overtaking Japan as the world's second largest economy in 2010, and of course the great watershed event uh, for Japanese understanding of potential Chinese coercion economic coercion, which was the, the temporary ban on exports of rare earths uh, to Japan from China in 2010 in retaliation for an increase in, uh, in the tension around the territorial dispute. But Abe's second term as prime minister from 2012 to 2020 really moved the, the debate in Japan on at, at an astonishingly fast speed, sort of Cholima speed, as uh, Kim Jong-un might say. Uh, certainly at least by the standards of previous years in, in, in Japan. And of course, the second term of Abe over, uh, sort of overlapped uh, with the start of uh, Xi Jinping's time in office as well. So there's a nice sort of uh, symmetry there, if you like. I'm going to group these uh, changes into four buckets. Uh, the first uh, in Japan uh, is institutional or what I call framework changes. Uh, so rattle through the highlights of these. 2013, creation of Japan's first National Security Council. Uh, 2013 release of Japan's first national security strategy, also same year update to Japan's national defense program guidelines and revision to the medium term defense program. 2014, the start of uh, constitutional changes in Japan to allow limited self, collective self-defense uh, and the enabling legislation for this passed by the DART in 2015. Also 2015 revised guidelines for US-Japan Defense Corporation, the first such since 1997. These included enhanced interoperability between Japan and the US, uh, peacetime cooperation uh, between Japan and the US for the first time, cooperation in new domains for the first time, and of course, very, very importantly, sort of the global scope of this alliance. And in 2018, another update of the National Defense Program guidelines. The second uh, in, these, in my four um, items in my bucket are capability improvements. Um, these, Japan's been increasing the pace of its military build-up uh, under the, the, the defense budgets under 1% of GDP traditionally, uh, but Japan's GDP has obviously been expanding. Uh, and there's a very interesting article the other day uh, in which, in the Nikkei, one of Japan's biggest newspapers, of course, in which the defense minister, Kishi Nobuo, uh, hinted that if, if, if the circumstances required it, that Japan might smash through that 1%, uh, that 1% uh, limit. Uh, the last two in, in my bucket are, are coalitions. Uh, Japan's been very active uh, over the last 10 years in building coalitions in all sorts of areas. We'll talk about the economic coalitions in a bit, I think. Uh, but in the, in the defense security uh, sphere, Japan's been strengthening relations uh, with like-minded countries in the region, notably Australia uh, and India through the Quad. Uh, interestingly, the Quad momentum has really accelerated since Suga uh, took office. So uh, contrary to the expectations of many, uh, as Suga was taking office last year, some of his greatest successes, actually, I would argue, have been in the foreign policy space. Uh, and finally, and, and really interesting, I think, for the region is Japan's changing tone on Taiwan. Uh, we saw this, we've seen this a number of times uh, in over the last, uh, well, since, since this year started, the two plus two, of course, earlier in 2021, the, the reference to the, the interest of both parties in stability in the Taiwan Strait, uh, the similar reference in the uh, Suga Biden summit, uh, of course. And again, I come back to this interview by Kishi in the Nikkei 
uh, in which he referred to sort of problems in Taiwan as also being problems for Japan, uh, because of course of the proximity uh, of, of Taiwan to the Senkaku uh, Dayu Islands uh, down there in that very contested a bit, bit of the world. Um, so lots of stuff going on, um, on on the security front, of course. The big question is sort of my final point uh, is, is how fast will the pace of change be going forward? Under Abe, it was very fast, um, but Abe was given a, an, an enabler uh, because of his political stability and his longevity. He could fight, he could fight election after election uh, and won. Uh, how, I, I suspect, how, how much, how fast the pace of the debate goes in Japan will depend to a large extent on, to a large uh, extent on the uh, on the political strength, whoever whoever holds office as prime minister. Thanks so much, Robert. Uh, you mentioned uh, the watershed event in uh, Japanese policy towards uh, China. Um, our other author, Ashley, also mentions it in his chapter, another watershed event, and that's the Australia 2020 Defence Strategic Update. Um, what does the document say, Ashley, or say or imply about how Australia views China and the United States, and what's behind some of that thinking? Ashley? Thanks, Lynn, and, uh, and thanks very much to, to my colleagues and friends here on this panel at IISS uh, for the invitation this evening. Um, as you say, Lynn, the now almost one year old Australian uh, 2020 Defence Strategic Update uh, really was a watershed document in Australian uh, strategic policy terms. Um, and the reason I say that is not just because of the fact that it was launched amidst the pandemic at the beginning of a still ongoing campaign of Chinese economic coercion against Australia in terms by the Prime Minister that were couched uh, similarly to the um, existential threats that the, that the region faced and that Australian faced, and Australia faced rather in the 90s and 30s and 40s. But even perhaps more important than that, it's the first time since the 1950s, really, that Australia has redefined its own defence policy in terms of its force structure planning and its strategic policy planning in genuinely regional terms. That is to say that Australia is no longer pursuing a direct defence of Australia continentalist mindset, as some Australian strategists, prominent though they may be, have advocated in recent years nor is Australia going to continue to pursue the sort of post 9-11 global order defending uh, role that it played as a coalition partner with the United States in the Middle East. But instead, Australia is defining its own uh, national security in terms that relate to the quality and the nature of the Indo-Pacific regional order. And that is that part of the Indo-Pacific stretching from the northeastern Indian Ocean through mainland and maritime Southeast Asia, and onwards through Papua New Guinea to the Southwest Pacific. That is a really big change in Australian strategic policy history. I think it's predominantly motivated by what we might say a balance of power calculations when it comes to Canberra's assessment of the regional strategic environment. Um, as I said, the Prime Minister used extremely stark terms in launching the document. And in fact, if you read the 2020 Defence Strategic Update, it very quickly gives rise to a sense of strategic emergency when it comes to looking at the Indo-Pacific. And indeed, that is a term that's used frequently in Canberra these days. Um, in so far as China is concerned, there are the familiar concerns that you've seen since uh, the white papers of the early 2000s um, that talk about the progress that China is making with regards to its conventional military capabilities and its development of new military technologies and their impact or the capacity that they could impact on Australian continental security. Those are still there, but they're now being put in much more urgent terms. And in fact, the term is used in the 2020 Defence Strategic Update um, that Australia no longer has what it has always had, which is a sense of a 10 year warning time for any direct threat against Australia or its interests. And dissolving that with regards to our defence planning guidelines is again another big step that points to Australian assessments that China really does have the power and potentially over time the intentions uh, to cause problems for Australia in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, but it's not all about the conventional military balance when it comes to China. It's as much about the grey zone threats and the grey zone coercion that China 
is already using, not just against Australia in the current um, economic coercion phase of the relationship, which has indeed hit rock bottom, but in but vis a vis multiple countries across the region where China is using disinformation, it's using political intimidation, it's using trade leverage in order to shift and try and get regional countries to not take positions on issues that matter to China that it doesn't want them to take. So that part of the defence strategic update really does couch China as a threat to Australian interests in, in current terms. When it comes to the United States, once again, the balance of power calculations, I think, loom large in Australian strategic assessments. And you really have to go back to the 2017 um, Australian foreign policy white paper to unlock what's really going on in the current document. Uh, the 2017 white paper looked at the Indo-Pacific in terms of alignments and power dynamics and made the point or the observation really that China will overtake the United States by uh, the end of this decade, both in GDP as well as, as it already has, purchasing power terms as a major economy in the region. But since then, you've seen the prime minister, the foreign minister make comments about the end of the unipolar moment. Um, you've seen um, the outgoing secretary of the, of the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade look at the United States position and argue that, in fact, the United States won't be able to exercise leadership in the way it once could. And all of this, uh, including Australian assessments about the sort of underpinnings, technological, military, political underpinnings of American power, come together to make one key point for Australian policymakers, which is this. The United States won't be able to uphold a favourable balance of power in the Indo-Pacific by itself. And therefore, Australia, along with Japan, India and other regional countries will increasingly need to play a complementary role to the United States in order to maintain, um, broadly speaking, a balance of power that can manage and constrain uh, Chinese adventurism, as indeed we expect that to continue over time. The final point, and, and I'll leave you all with this, um, is that this shift to a, a competitive US-China strategic dynamic, much as uh, in the case with Japan, does also pose problems for Australia. And in many ways, like countries in Southeast Asia, Australia wants the region to find a settling point. It wants to avoid conflict and confrontation between the US and China, even as it is deeply invested in the United States success. And so Australia, like many others in the region, are looking for ways to mitigate a confrontational uh, direction in US-China relations, even as they're looking to contribute to a stable balance of power. Thanks so much, Ashley. And of course, you mentioned um, the desire of all countries th in the region, uh, for, well, most countries in the region, uh, to avoid confrontation, even, w even whilst they might be concerned about certain aspects of Chinese or even the United States behavior. And I think that's an important point to highlight. Um, I think moving to Kanti at the, uh, now, um, Quite apart from the 2020 defence strategic update uh, that Australia issued last year, we also saw another significant event, and that, of course, was the confrontation between India and China on, uh, at the border, uh, the Ladakh crisis. So what has the crisis uh, meant for India's tr China uh, strategy, and can we consider that um, uh, uh, an event that catalyzed India's foreign policy and security policy vis-a-vis -vis China? Yeah, thanks very much, Lynn, and uh, I think you used the right word. Uh, uh, while uh, the others were talking, I wrote down defining moment here, and um, I think the crisis in the dark in the summer of 2020, uh, looking back on it, we're going to see that uh, it was a defining moment. Uh, to uh, appreciate that, I think one has to kind of look at the trend in India-China relations over a long period of time, and essentially India's always been conscious that China is a bigger power and, and, and a superior power, um, and has alternated between two responses to China. The first, going back to the 1950s, has been negotiation. After the 1962 war, it moved to a second paradigm, uh, which was trying to balance uh, Chinese power. That was succeeded in the, uh, by the end of the Cold War with a return to a negotiation paradigm uh, in dealing with China. Um, and I think from 2008, somewhat prior to the crisis, of course, some years prior, uh, the increasing incidence of Chinese incursions into, uh, into India uh, began to move India towards a power balancing paradigm once again. And I think the tipping point really was reached 
uh, with the crisis in the dark in the summer of 2020. And essentially, India seems now to be embarked on a grand strategy that really uh, emphasizes uh, two components, uh, balancing internally, that is through one's own efforts, and balancing externally, that is partnering with other powers uh, to try and, and balance China. So I want to say a few words uh, about both forms of balancing um, and to leave you with a thought about some of the challenges uh, that come out of these uh, two tracks of internal balancing and external balancing. And just to give the game away, um, I think uh, internal balancing, as the audience will appreciate, uh, takes uh, quite a lot of time to achieve. Uh, economically and militarily to build your uh, capabilities uh, isn't done overnight. But uh, pallying up to or, or partnering with external powers that count is probably quicker to do. Um, and I think this poses a, a bit of a dilemma for India, which has never been very happy uh, being part of a putative uh, alliance, but is being pushed in that direction because of its own internal constraints. So say, let me say something about both the internal balancing efforts and also the external balancing efforts uh, before uh, ending my remarks. On the internal balancing, there are two components. Uh, there's the economic kind of uh, rehabilitation of India but also the military. Um, and uh, I think in both cases, there have been two components again. So there's been a kind of economic bearing of the teeth against China and a military bearing of the teeth against China in the wake of the crisis. Uh, but there's also been an effort to build capacity economically and build military capacity for the longer term. So just a few words on both of those. Um, I think in terms of the bearing teeth economically, uh, the word decoupling has been mentioned, and India did its own form of decoupling. Uh, so it took some steps to raise tariffs vis-a-vis -vis Chinese goods. It uh, made it difficult for Chinese companies to invest in the Indian economy, and probably most notoriously, it banned a whole bunch of Chinese apps, about 100 of them, uh, uh, that uh, you know, Indian consumers and, and young people enjoyed, such as uh, TikTok. Uh, so that was uh, quite telling, and that was kind of the, the bearing teeth economically. I think in the uh, um, capability building economically, uh, India has, under its so-called Atma Nirbhan Abhiyan, um, has pushed through a series of reforms in, a, in the last uh, year, year and a half. Agricultural reforms, which have been quite controversial, um, uh, the paring down of uh, public spending in certain areas, but increasing liquidity in other areas, uh, reforms in terms of the, the public se sector enterprises, trying to sell them off, uh, and so on. Um, so I think that's the picture on the economic side, a certain amount of bearing teeth and a certain number of fundamental uh, kinds of reforms for the longer term. On the military side, I think the bearing teeth uh, are quite interesting. For instance, uh, India carried out nine missile tests in September, October of 2020 in the wake of the most serious part of the crisis uh, in a period of 35 days. A whole range of these missiles were tested, unprecedented, I think, uh, in Indian strategic history. India also pushed some of its boats into the South China Sea uh, to send a message that on the naval side, India would be a bit more active and look China in the eye. But on the long-term capability side, uh, just as it emphasized self-reliance of this Atman Nirbharta in economics, um, India has also started to emphasize uh, you know, self-reliance on the military side. Uh, recently, uh, in the wake of the crisis, uh, it notified a list, presented a list of 100 defense items that it would now like to produce within the next five years uh, on its own, sometimes in collaboration, in licensing collaboration with foreigners, uh, but substantially with its own private sector players and its own pri uh, public defense sector enterprises. Um, and so we'll see how that goes, but uh, uh, India certainly laid down a, a kind of plan for the next five, perhaps 10 years, of military self-reliance. One should remember India is one of the biggest importers of arms anywhere in the world, so this turn is, is significant as well. Coming to the external balance, I mean, I think here the story is more straightforward, but as uh, noted by Robert Ward and others, there's been a quickening of the pace of the Quad. And so India, which has been ambivalent to some extent about the Indo-Pacific idea, um, it's sometimes been warmer towards it and sometimes been a bit cooler towards it, I think in the wake of the crisis, it certainly started to mouth uh, the Indo-Pacific vocabulary far more, and it's kicked up the level of meetings to which it's committed itself 
you know, to the foreign minister's level and, and so on, to show its, its much greater commitment. But I think the real action has probably been in, a, in, a, in a sort of the military arm of the, of the Indo-Pacific, which is the Quad. And here, I think, uh, Indian participation has been at a, a, a higher level again. Uh, but the discussions have been far more substantive about what India can do uh, militarily. And I think this is, again, a sort of the bearing of the teeth towards, uh, towards uh, China. But I suppose more significantly, of course, India has taken the opportunity, finally, to declare itself a much closer partner of the United States. And I'll just point to a couple of things there and then close my remarks. I mean, uh, essentially, um, India finished the f uh, or signed the fourth of the, f the four foundational agreements that it had been tarrying over with the Americans, uh, and that was done uh, in the wake of the crisis. Uh, it's also now really got on board the two plus two uh, meetings, that is, uh, the defense and foreign ministers meeting their counterparts uh, much more regularly. Uh, and of course, American arms imports uh, have, have increased uh, uh, at some pace, I think, in, in this period. And more generally, I think, India has um, uh, continued to increase its arms imports as part of its external balancing. So I think that's the broad picture. I just want to end with this thought again to underline it, which is that internal balancing is great. And I think a country like India, which in its strategic culture has always stressed a degree of independence and standing up for itself. But in the short term, when you're confronting China, you need friends and partners. And I think uh, India's really having to uh, struggle with the idea of committing to a coalition. And uh, uh, it's not great at that, but it's, I think, learning how to, to, to cope and commit. Uh, so let me just stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Kanti. And uh, you mentioned the bearing of the teeth. Uh, Sarah wrote a chapter on uh, NATO and its China policy. So NATO is not quite bearing its teeth uh, to China, and yet it's concerned. Uh, Sarah, can you tell us why NATO, uh, whose traditional traditionals we have influenced, has been outside the Asia Pacific region? Why it's concerned about China and developments in the Asia Pacific? Thank you very much, Lynn, indeed, uh, for having me on. Um, this is a uh, concern that has been developing slowly and quietly for a while, where we've seen a big push in the wake of the 2019 NATO summit, uh, that specifically for the first time highlighted China and the potential challenges that China posed the collective security agreement. Um, and Kanti, you know, has already talked about a watershed moment. And I think we might look back on 2019 with the agreement to finally get the Allies talking about China as one of those watershed moments. We'll know more um, on the 14th of June when we see the details of the NATO 2030 package um, as announced, uh, where we've heard from Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg yesterday uh, it will be um, deeply connected to the discussion on how NATO should go about um, uh, working and considering the challenges that China poses. I mean, when he launched this package, um, uh, these discussions in June 2020 of last year, the Secretary General um, pretty much answered your question, Lynn, um, by saying the following, that China is coming closer to NATO, both geographically, in the Arctic, in Africa, and physically, for example, in terms of investments in alliance infrastructure and the potential security implications this brings, and also in cyberspace. And he highlighted how China is working more closely, including militarily, of course, uh, with NATO's traditional and still very much primary target of concern, uh, namely Russia. So the idea, as then presented, wasn't so much about NATO's focus shifting to China, but rather about making sure to include China in consideration of NATO's area of focus. You know, and that's an important way of presenting this for bringing and sort of cultivating allied unity. You know, but of course, it is a little bit disingenuous because one of the key packages that we're going to see in NATO 2030 will actually be developing and building on these uh, global partnerships that NATO has been cultivating that, of course, inevitably uh, bring it uh, into a uh, greater presence in the Indo-Pacific. You know, but ultimately, I think this NATO attention on uh, China is pretty much fair enough because 
it's sort of illogical to talk about promoting resilience in NATO member states and in NATO partner countries and taking a whole of society approach to promoting resilience and then not talk about China's investments in critical digital, technological, physical infrastructure in NATO member states. You can't argue for an alliance to be stronger politically which is the aim of this NATO 2030 package, or one of the aims of it, or just for the alliance to strengthen its global partnerships and then not address the challenge that China presents, whether with regard to alliance cohesion or the centrality that China plays in the strategic thinking of some NATO member states and many NATO global partners. You know, Robert talked in his chapter, and we've just discussed it sort of here, where lots of the speakers have alluded to the sort of escalation of of Chinese strategic opportunism, I think is what Robert called it. And I think that this adventurism has helped galvanize support for a more active look in China in many different forums, and NATO's no exception. Uh, and to finish with, one thing I do think is interesting is that the values piece, of course, has deep historical roots in NATO. And that values piece is very much coming back to the fore now as NATO looks again at the China challenge, because Perhaps ultimately, as I say in my chapter, it's unsurprising that a communist country that is now more actively promoting an alternative set of values, possessing the most populous military forces in the world, supported by this world's second largest defense budget, a country that is investing heavily in military modernization, including in missiles that can reach NATO countries. It's unsurprising that a country with these characteristics is attracting NATO attention. To me, that seems entirely logical. Thanks, Sarah. Let's stay with you for a moment. Um, you talked about the challenges that uh, China presents to cohesion within, the, uh, within NATO. Um, I'll turn to Drew in a second to look at the challenges China uh, poses to ASEAN cohesion and ASEAN centrality. But Sarah, to what extent do you think NATO has a coherent strategy for responding to uh, developments in the region and the sort of challenges that it foresees itself facing um, uh, with China in its area of focus? Sure. I mean, building a coherent strategy um, is clearly very much a work in progress, to put it politely. But we will see the next building blocks of these efforts to build a more coherent strategy in the package of measures that are put forward as part of NATO 2030. And ultimately, I don't think it's particularly surprising that we're going to have to struggle on this complex nuance issue to create some sort of consensus, both within and across 30 different member states. I mean, we're used now to talking about cross-party consensus on China in the US. But for a multitude of different reasons, we're just not there yet in terms of most other NATO states. Now, ultimately, the way around this in true diplomatic fashion is by fudging it. And there's actually a certain amount of productive fudging that can be done. We talk, for example, of China as a strategic competitor and a partner. We talk about how the CCP's international policies present both challenges and opportunities. The NATO Secretary General has gone out of his way to emphasize that NATO, and I quote, NATO does not see China as the new enemy. And I think we're going to see more of this in the package of measures in the coming days. So I don't know for certain, but I would be very surprised if NATO 2030 doesn't have something about climate change in it not only because climate change matters, of course, but also because it helps that members can also point to areas of cooperation and opportunity uh, with China. You know, I saw Jens Stoltenberg talking yesterday about how China will feature heavily in this NATO 2030 package and how consensus, he claims, has been secured. And I would, you know, let's wait and see the detail, but super consensus isn't actually that hard to do. And I want to just give one example of that. Let's take promoting the rules-based order, which is something I think we'll see in the package of measures that comes out, where we can say that NATO member states agree. So yes, there's consensus, and yes, it relates to China. 
But what happens is China is given different priorities by different partners. So the US can work on NATO, uh, doing more to promote the rules-based order by developing partnerships in the Indo-Pacific. And Eastern NATO member states, Eastern European and Central European NATO member states, can say that uh, NATO is promoting the rules-based order by focusing on working more closely, for example, with NATO accession countries in their region. And perhaps a little cheekily, but Paris, for example, can say that it is doing more promoting the rules-based order as a NATO member state by building up EU capacities and standard setting, which are absolutely fundamental for this debate. So I think we don't have a problem with differing you know, political prioritization. That's a reality. That's a way that you form and build consensus. Everything can be connected back to China or just some things be, can be connected back to China. And we start by picking and mixing those themes because this is a nuanced and complex conversation on an issue that is genuinely concerning and where, you know, given two years ago, NATO was finding it difficult to agree whether it should even mention the words China in its strategic concept. And we were commissioning papers on understanding China better to try and build that dynamic. I suspect that we will find in, uh, on June 14th, uh, when we see the package of measures, that NATO really has come quite a long way on the China debate and on building consensus, albeit that there's a long way still to go. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Drew, perhaps you'd like to address um, how well you think ASEAN is faring in, the, uh, uh, in, in terms of having a coordinated approach towards China. Certainly. I think the, the first thing to really consider is that uh, uh, you have to distinguish between ASEAN as an organization and individual Southeast Asian states. And I think that's really important just as a caveat to begin with. And it goes without saying, but it needs to be said, that, that the state of the US-China relationship is very deeply felt here in Southeast Asia. So I think individual ASEAN states have made it very clear that they do not want to choose between the US and China. And they very much see some of their own internal challenges as inexplicably, uh, inextricably undividable from that US-China dyad. And I would argue that that in some cases those, um, those linkages between US-China tensions and the challenges felt here in Southeast Asia are maybe a little bit overplayed. Um, but, but essentially what Southeast Asian states want to see from the United States is, is, is basically four things. They want to see predictability and political presence as well as a, as a certain degree of security presence. They, they want the US to embrace ASEAN centrality and make it central to, uh, to its approach to the region. And they also want to see greater U.S. economic engagement in the region. And fourthly, I think ASEAN states generally want to see a much more tempered and less uh, tension-filled U.S.-China relationship. So just because uh, Southeast Asian states want that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to get it. And I increasingly have the sense that Washington uh, sees uh, ASEAN and ASEAN states is very much defined by their negative policies. Basically what, what ASEAN states won't do. They won't choose sides or they won't uh, uh, take measures to uh, pressure other countries to deal with intractable problems uh, such as Myanmar. Um, so for, for, for countries in the region that want to get more out of the United States, they may have to make more investments into that bilateral relationship with the US. And I think some of those investments that they could make or steps they could take could include matching their private requests of the United States with more public statements of support for a robust and sustained uh, US presence. I think also demonstrating that ASEAN centrality is more than just a slogan is another important uh, measure that they can take. And another issue I think is also ASEAN's going to have to, to figure out how it can complement or at least peacefully coexist with other groupings in the region, such as the Quad, which I think is going to be less inclusive, but potentially more outcome-oriented than, than ASEAN might be. But, but back to something concrete like the, the desire for more U.S. economic engagement to balance 
uh, China's economic influence. That's a very consistent theme that you hear from, from states here. And, and I think increasing U.S. economic investment in the region is not really a function of U.S.-China relations. And I don't think it's, it's also driven by Washington's political preferences. It's really driven by the private sector's risk perceptions and willingness to invest in various markets in Southeast Asia. And that's really a function of those individual countries and uh, their, their market's openness and their level of good governance and transparency and infrastructure and you know, an educated workforce and, and a good regulatory environment and legal system that would encourage and support uh, a, a better trade and investment from the United States. And if those conditions are met, then I think U.S. investment and trade and economic influence in the region grows substantially. But what the U.S. is not is it's not China. It's not a state-led economy. So, so I think ASEAN states um, have a great deal of, of agency in that respect and that they can determine uh, how much to draw the U.S. into the region. And Ashley made, made a very good point as well about um, other countries having to step up to maintain that balance of power with China and not just rely on the United States to do the hev heavy lifting. And, and I'd argue that that doesn't just apply to Australia, Japan, and, and India, um, but it also applies to other countries um, and smaller countries that are invested in upholding that rules-based international order. And I think this is a really key aspect of that agency that Southeast Asian states seek. So, so I think Forcing countries to, to choose or implying um, economic coercion against them or linking their own development uh, challenges to the U.S.-China relationship is really somewhat disingenuous. And, and I think it, it does uh, those Southeast Asian countries a disservice uh, and denies them that agency that I think they rightly, uh, rightly deserve. Thanks. Um, I think you brought up the very important uh, question of uh, the desire for greater U.S. economic engagement in the region to balance China. I think one country that has particularly understood the critical link between economic security and um, and broader security issues has been Japan. Um, Robert, I was wondering whether you could uh, touch a little on, very quickly, on Japan and how it's deployed economic statecraft in the pursuit of broader geopolitical gains. Um, I think we also have a question um, that I'll turn to after this uh, on uh, the issue of broader Japan-Australia cooperation, but uh, perhaps you could address that uh, question first, Robert. Thank you, Lynn. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I, I argue in my piece that Japan was an early mover in recognizing the overlap between economic security and hard security. And of course, for Japan, this, this sort of ability to, to flex its geoeconomic endowments is really important because of the constraints, constitutional constraints on its ability to wield uh, hard power. Uh, and this, uh, this identification of the overlap, which happened under uh, Abe again, um, is now mainstream thinking uh, in, in, in the West, um, especially around the resilient uh, portion of this. Uh, we, will, we, we will wait and see what they have to say at the G7 as all the leaders descend on, uh, on beautiful Cornwall, uh, but I'm sure that uh, resilience will, will play a part of this. But what Japan gets right, I think, which is sort of less present in the resilience debate at the moment, is the need to think about economic statecraft connectivity uh, as, as well as resilience. And uh, with, it, with, with this in, in mind, I want to make two main points. The first is to to situate Abe's uh, free and open Indo-Pacific uh, vision, concept, policy, call it what you like, FOIP, uh, at the center of Japan's thinking of economic statecraft. So um, un unlike um, what you may hear, FOIP is not uh, primarily a security construct. It's a, it is a tool of economic statecraft. And there are some security underpinnings to this, but this is, it is primarily around economic statecraft. Um, and, and Sarah talked about the values piece and, and some of the most important sort of pillars supporting uh, FOIP are, are around values, so uh, uh, are very loosely defined. So the promotion of the rule of law, freedom of navigation, pr promotion of economic prosperity through improving economic and institutional connectivity and promotion of peace and stability through capacity building and humanitarian uh, assistance. So it does sit in contradistinction to China's uh, BRI uh, but it depends on Japan, its success depends on Japan building coalitions of the like-minded. So it's about networks rather than the BRI, which is about sort of hub and spokes with, with China in the middle. Um, 
From FOIP, we've had, of course, uh, CPTPP, which can be seen in, in FOIP terms. Again, this is the very most important bit of the CPTPP, in my view, is that it's underpinned by uh, standards and sort of and setting aspirational standards for all those for all those members. Uh, the UK's uh, membership will be particularly important, less uh, less because of the trade effects for the UK, but more because of the more because of the geopolitical ballast that the UK uh, will bring. Um, and also very important that CPTPP keeps expanding, given now that we've got RCEP, uh, which I know that the um, those in ASEAN will will say this is an ASEAN-driven thing, but having China in the middle of RCEP also does create quite a lot of gravitational pull towards China. So again, I think for the CPTPP, RCEP does uh, does present some uh, problems. Also interesting from this sort of FOIP point of view is the expansion of the Quad uh, now beyond hard security into uh, supply chain resilience, uh, climate change and vaccines um, as well. Um, the second point, very briefly, um, about how Japan's thinking about its economic statecraft is around the institutional changes that, that, that Abe made at home. Uh, most notably, the Interagency uh, National Security Secretariat Economics Division, uh, which was launched in, in 2020. Uh, this, this, I think, is the NSS's biggest, uh, biggest unit, as I said, interagency, so it brings all of Japan's famously fractured uh, experts together, at least in theory. But I think the really interesting thing about the NSS is, is how broad its remit is around economic statecraft. So it includes thinking on digital currencies, as well as how to boost Japan's representation in international, institu international institutions, which, of course, are really important for, uh, for standard setting uh, and so on. So, I think uh, just to conclude, uh, I think this um, Japan's institutional changes, I think they also offer a model for other countries, other medium, smaller powers to, to think about policy in a way that brings uh, economics and security together, because they do go hand in hand now. Thank you so much, Robert. I think I'd like to stay on the issue of economics and security for a bit. Um, the flip side, of course, uh, of attempts to woo uh, Southeast Asia with promised economic reward is, is the economic uh, coercion that we've seen applied to countries like Australia. Um, and this ties in, of course, to a question that um, one of our audience has asked, um, Andy Wong from Metis Asia. He asked about you know, the ability of Australia to be able to... Uh, to to um, to uh, sustain itself or to to uh, produce uh, the, uh, the the resilience that it's able to do to kind of respond to Australia uh, to China's economic coercion. I'd like to join this actually to my question and and f so how first has uh, Australia fared in the face of Chinese coercion, and then second, you know how is uh, Chinese coercion, effect, economic coercion, affecting Australia's efforts to bolster collective action and regional resilience? Thanks, Lynn. Um, look, there, there are a great set of questions, and, uh, uh, and, and not to be cute, but the second one, we don't know the answer for, 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 for some time, but there are some, some, I think, cautionary principles to bear in mind. With regards to the former part, how has Australia gone um, in fairing uh, Chinese economic coercion? The answer is basically pretty well. Um, although we have seen it, and there are various different ways of calculating, if you like, the, the damage or the exposure to economic coercion, complicated by the fact that so many industries, um, including international students and tourism, are just not happening in Australia right now. Uh, uh, but, but it's somewhere between 10 and $40 billion dollars uh, US, again, depending on the time frame that you, that you take. Um, but if you look at Australia's ability to find new markets for many of those commodities, in the case of Australian beef, in the, in the case of Australian barley, in the case of timber, you name it, for the most part, Australia has managed to do that. And in fact, you've seen a, a very much a cushioning of the potential effects of Chinese economic coercion with regards to the economic damage um, itself um, in the diversification agenda that Australia is now very much championing um, at, a, at, a, at a Commonwealth level with regards to strategies to withstand economic coercion going forward. Of course, some industries um, haven't been targeted and could cause a lot of damage. Uh, iron ore is the big example there. And if, 
if indeed China does really decide to try to inflict economic damage rather than just economic coercion, which is really about changing the political decision that the government is taking, then of course it could use the iron ore weapon, but that would also mean it would incur a degree of cost itself because Australian iron ore, like Australian minerals writ large, are very much uh, world class when it comes to their price and quality on international markets. But that is one direction things could take if they really did deteriorate. On the other hand, you have um, uh, the industries that might have been significant affected, significantly affected rather, but which we don't um, have data for yet. And that's the case with Chinese uh, tourism and Chinese students. And of course, the Chinese ambassador sort of brazenly here in Australia last year dangled the prospects that China would encourage um, its nationals not to study and not to visit Australia in response to Australia's position on calling for an international inquiry into the origins of COVID-19. Well, that could still come to pass. But then once again, there the government has many levers um, in play to incentivize others, um, other countries to send their students and other countries to, to come to Australia for tourism when that indeed reopens. So we'll see. I, I think the second point to make here, though, is it's not just about Australia. Uh, Australia does want to weather the economic damage and has demonstrated a, an ability to do so. But just as important for Australia is not being seen as an example of a country that is you know, encountering a lot of damage and if you like sacrificing itself for standing up for its interests and principles. And on the contrary, it would much prefer to be seen as a country that is able to get through this, to diversify, to withstand the damage and therefore indirectly incentivize other countries, including those in the region, including those in Southeast Asia, to take, if you like, um, more um, a brazen steps to stand up for their own interests, come what may, including come what may with regards to Chinese economic coercion. So here, I think um, the jury is, is still out. Of course, there have been other countries, as Robert has just spoken about in the case of Japan. Japan has been a country that has been on the receiving line of Chinese economic coercion. South Korea, India, the Philippines, Australia isn't alone, but the scale, intensity, and, and really suspected permanence of this um, is something different. So for Australia, success with regards to withstanding economic coercion and building out, Liam, as you asked, a broader regional um, a resilient strategy, it will really hinge on us being able to communicate to other countries that, in fact, you can get through economic coercion provided you take um, the right steps at, at a national level. And of course, there, there are clearly structural differences with regards to the Australian economy and others in the region that will make that more or less successful for regional countries. Thank you, Ashley. Um, I think I'll go to the question posed by Bryce Wakefield now. Um, he's asked um, the following. We've seen Japan and Australia grow increasingly close in the last year, signified by the agreement in principle on a reciprocal access agreement. Both in their own strategic documents have focused on grey zone activities. What is the most effective areas where Japan and Australia can cooperate to, to counteract China's grey zone activities? He's po posed the question to Ashley and Robert, but I think I'll go to Robert for a quick answer and then we'll move on to a few questions um, on the quad. So, Robert, please. So, um one, one of the things that struck me about um, uh, the way that Australia's gone about this is, is, is and, and Ashley will presumably correct me, uh, I, I got this wrong, um, was the sort of lack of coordination in its reaction towards what uh, China's coercion with other like-minded uh, countries in the region. So, for example, um, uh, with, uh, with, with, with uh, cyber attacks and so on, or with the uh, import uh, issues and so on. Um, and I, I always thought there's a very strong case for uh, much more coordination between the like-minded. So in Australia's case with South Korea, for example, uh, and, and Japan. Um, and I think sort of building these uh, coalitions, and I think Japan is absolutely right to be, to be pushing this because clearly the, the smaller powers on their own are, are, can't stand up to the bigger powers. But uh, if they work together, then they do have a lot of balance. I think that is one of the keys to, um, uh, to, to increasing resilience uh, across the board. Thanks, Robert. Um, now a couple of questions on the quad. We have a few. Uh, let's start with James Crabtree's uh, question of, um, and of course, James is executive director of the IISS. Um, how optimistic um, 
are the speakers, that the Quad will be effect an effective balance against China, and in which direction do you think the Quad will go next? I think I'll post this question uh, to Kanti. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, we saw the Quad come out with a blast this year with its um, statement that it would cooperate on uh, uh, vaccines, you know, the U United States and Japan would pay for them, India will, would produce them and Australia would uh, distribute them. But of course, we've seen things take quite a downturn with uh, developments in India, not least uh, with respect to COVID. So on the question that James poses, you know, how effective a balance against China would the Quad be and in which direction will the Quad go next? So that's one. And then uh, a follow up from uh, James, uh, from John Chipman, who's, um, uh, of course, the director general of the IISS. Is the Quad a potentially inclusive and open structure? What would the thoughts of India and Australia be if either the UK or France or both sought as part of the Indo-Pacific tilt to join the grouping? And that can be either for Kanti or Ashley. So two questions in the quad to start off with. Yeah, let me just begin with uh, some Indian attitudes uh, towards the quad. I mean, I think certainly India is more interested in the quad than uh, FOIP, which uh, I think, uh, as was said, is more economically oriented, related to connectivity and those kinds of things, and perhaps non-traditional security. Whereas I think India sees the Quad more as the military wing. So, um, but having said that, you know, India uh, has uh, a certain degree of ambivalence towards the Quad, and this comes out of several kinds of concerns or calculations. One is, of course, how far does India want to go in teaming up with these countries? Uh, how much would it provoke China? And and you know, a, a precipitate a, a problem, a deepening of the problem with China. I think the other problem is um, there are all kinds of contradictions with the Americans, uh, uh, somewhat related to uh, what Delhi sees as an American preoccupation with the Pacific rather than the Indian Ocean. And I think India is more into the Quad for its uh, Indo, uh, for its uh, for its Indian Ocean kind of opening rather than the Pacific preoccupation. So I think that's another problem. Um, there are other uh, kinds of contradictions with the Americans, Pakistan, Afghan policy, uh, you know, relations with uh, Russia, and so on. So I think, you know, India always has a, a degree of, 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 of kind of trepidation about uh, how things might get linked up that might affect its participation in, in the Quad, uh, issues that are outside the region. And I think likewise with, with Japan and, and even Australia, I think there are contradictions over various things. Um, some of them relate to things that have nothing to do very much with uh, uh, strategic issues here. They may relate more to social and political and e economic things. Um, so I think the general Indian hope or fantasy would be that, you know, it free rides as much as possible in the Quad, uh, while really using the Quad to kind of suggest to the Chinese, if you push us too hard, uh, here's something that we'll completely defect to. Uh, rather than just flirt with. Uh, and I think that's the, it's, the Quad could increase India's bargaining room. And perhaps you know, each of the members of the Quad has something like that view, which is messaging the Chinese that uh, the Quad is useful. It's not an alliance. It's not NATO. But don't push us beyond the point, because we might turn it into something like that. And I think that's the kind of uh, uh, use of the Quad, I think, is probably the most likely in, uh, uh, ahead. And just one word very quickly and then pass it on to others. Um, I think India recently has started reaching out to the EU countries more than before, and the three major ones, that is the UK, France, and Germany, and is very uh, hopeful that they will all show their naval flags more and more uh, in the Indian Ocean and uh, Pacific. And so I think in terms of the inclusivity of the Quad, I think India would be probably be fairly open to having them more and more in it. Now, the one constraint, of course, is that in all of this, India also keeps an eye on ASEAN and its sensitivities. And it's very aware that ASEAN uh, has its own difficulties with uh, FOIP and, and, and the Quad. And it doesn't want to alienate ASEAN. So I think India is playing a very fine hand. And I think as Drew and perhaps others have gestured at, um, all these uh, four uh, quad parts have to keep an eye on uh, ASEAN's uh, kinds of concerns uh, about the development of the, of the quad and its uh, greater inclusivity. So a fine game for everyone. 
uh, short conclusion, I think the quad will grow, and I think it may grow in terms of its inclusivity, uh, but it will be a slow process, and I think uh, everyone will be trying to signal China more than anything else about this kind of wheel defect to something worse if you push us too hard. So first, Drew, and then Ashley, for your views, Ashley, on, um, on whether or not uh, Australia as a Quad member would be open to uh, the UK or France or both being part of the Quad grouping. Um, Drew, ASEAN's view in the Quad? Very quickly. So I, I think the, I mean, ASEAN is, is ambivalent about it at best, but I think maybe what's more interesting was, would be a US perspective. And I think the US uh, default setting on foreign policy is essentially partnership. And I wouldn't see the US necessarily as, as rejecting other other partners, uh, and, and I think they'd embrace inclusivity. Uh, but I think the US focus would be on results-oriented. Uh, so rather than a symbolic do-nothing organization, they really want it to be an organization that can tackle these big issues, such as uh, uh, climate change or the pandemic. So I think there'd be room for uh, you know, France, the UK, Germany, South Korea to participate in quad activities. And, and you could, I mean, predicting the future is difficult, but, but you could foresee you know, quad plus frameworks that would include a quad plus ASEAN or quad plus Korea or quad plus uh, other partners who can jump in on areas that, that they see a common interest, whether that's climate change, whether that's maritime security, whether that's fisheries enforcement or, or other economic issues that suit them. And I think that's the diversity that the Quad brings. But as long as it's, is it's outcomes oriented and, and not just a talk shop that I think it maintains its value. Thanks, Drew. Ashley? Look, I think um, that with the increasing um, amount of security cooperation partnerships between Australia and European countries, notably the French, the British and the Germans, um, the government would, of course, look fondly on any um, 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 initiative to create quad plus agendas or quad plus mechanisms in the region on a range of specific regional issues. Uh, but, but look, I think the broader point about it is this. Um, the Quad is absolutely enjoying a renaissance at the moment. But the rhetoric significantly outstrips the reality of what it can and is likely to be in the short term, in my view. Um, take Australia and the United States. Um, these two countries that are close allies and during the 70th anniversary of the alliance this year are still not able to really do combined military strategy at a bilateral level. Yet we are not able to undertake industrial collaboration in an integrated way for even defense technologies, let alone other things, and we are the closest of allies. So for the Quad agenda, as it was announced at the Leader Summit earlier this year, to have critical technologies um, as a forward agenda for it over the balance of this year and into the future, or for things like climate change, again, where the positions of certain countries are very different to each other, to me is a diffusion, and a dilution of what the Quad should be about. So if you return the Quad back to a sort of maritime security uh, primary purpose, I think there you can absolutely see both an, an agenda and a way forward for a densification of, let's say, um, anti-submarine warfare, exercises and operations potentially between the quad countries. There are already six ASW exercises that take place amongst quad countries at a trilateral level. So linking them up quadrilaterally is no stretch. If you're taking something um, of, of that nature as the focus of the quad, then I think on that issue and other issues as specific as ASW are places and avenues for bringing in fifth and sixth and seven country coalitions when the time is right and when those countries have a similar interest. But I think the short answer here is that it will be really uh, horses for courses when it comes to the Quad's expansion going forward. Thanks. And here, uh, the next question is for Sarah, um, but it's um, from Alex Neal, um, from, uh, who's uh, uh, from Alexander Neal Consulting. He was a former Shangri-La Dialogue Senior Fellow um, at IISS as well. So well, warm welcome to Alex. It's nice to hear from you. Um, his question is, how is the HMS Queen Elizabeth mission to the Indo-Pacific, um, or is the HMS Queen Elizabeth mission to the Indo-Pacific an extension of NATO concerns towards the China challenge? Sarah? 
I think uh, you can certainly frame it in that way, and the UK will be seeking to do so. But of course, it's also an extension of the UK's uh, interest in positioning itself as a persistent presence uh, with a persistent interest in the region. And I think that's primarily the position lens through which we should be seeing this, albeit that clearly it will be linking up with key bilateral partners who happen to be uh, NATO global partners as well. Uh, I mean, I think the EU is basically, the UK rather, is basically looking for every opportunity to actually put some substance on the declared tilt. This, of course, uh, mission by the HMS Elizabeth has been long planned uh, prior to the declaration of the Indo-Pacific tilt. But it does put obviously a nice lens on it. Uh, other things, apart from the HMS Elizabeth, we should see, there's not just activity going on in um, the eastern uh, Indian Ocean, um, but also in the western Indian Ocean. I think it was Kanti saying that, um, that India was very keen on uh, partners and allies uh, noting the Indian section of the, you know, the Indian bit of the Indian Pacific as well as the Asian bit of the Indian Pacific. And that, I think, there's something to watch there as well with what the UK is doing. First of all, most obviously with the Indian Ocean Commission, where it's looking for smaller regional organizations where it can develop closer partnerships too. Clearly, we've just been talking about aspirations at some point to partner or join more closely with the Quad, but there are several stepping stones of organizations that the UK will be looking at before then. Um, and that, I think, uh, includes the Western Indian Ocean with the Indian Ocean Commission, and then in time, albeit more complicated, uh, the Indian Ocean Rim Association as well, albeit that that's obviously a little bit more of a, a difficult challenge with the membership and diversity that's involved in that. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I think the final question that we'll have time for this evening um, is from Catherine Hill uh, from the Financial Times, and it's a question for Robert. Robert, just how far do you expect Japan to go in considering Taiwan in its security posture? How much concrete planning and preparation is Japan likely to do in its alliance with the United States for a Taiwan contingency? And what, in concrete terms, would Japan's role be? So not an easy question, Robert. Let's go out with a bang then. Uh, great, great question on that one. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, the, 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 the changes that Japan has made, um, uh, legal and uh, other changes, um, are around um, allowing Japan to be more active, but if there's, an exis if there's a threat to Japan's survival. So I think the key thing um, when, uh, if, any, if we have a Taiwan contingency, uh, would be for Japan to calibrate, and presumably China will be also calibrating this, uh, how much of uh, what's going on, what would be going on in, in that area would be um, existential for Japan, and that would define how, how much Japan uh, could do. Um, I think that Japan's um, recent comments on Taiwan are highly significant. Okay, it's, it's clear that we, we don't know uh, what Japan can do, and given all the constraints, um, uh, whatever Japan could do would have to be decided on, on the day, as it were. But having, but saying that um, uh, that Japan is uh, attaches importance to the stability in the Taiwan Strait does does commit Japan to a certain course of action if, if anything uh, were to happen. So it is a, it is a quite a significant uh, change of, uh, of of posture. This also goes hand in glove, of course, with the increased Chinese activity around the disputed Senkaku Daiyu uh, Islands. Um, and really, if you look at the charts about Chinese territorial needling uh, in the Senkaku Daiyu uh, Islands, um, it, it is very, very intense, of course. Um, and obviously, the situation has been, um, uh, the, the tensions have risen further with China's new Coast Guard law. So lots of tension around there that I think everybody needs to be, uh, to be watching. But also very interesting, I think, how, how Japan is, is responding to this uh, and its sort of, et sort of greater elevation a willingness, if you like, to express uh, to express concern. Thanks so much, Robert. I'm afraid that brings to a close today's panel. Um, I hope that the discussion and the chapters within the Asia Pacific Regional Security Assessment will only be the start of ever more fruitful discussions on the strategic present and future of the Asia Pacific. 
I'd like to thank all the authors of the Regional Security Assessment, uh, including those that were not able to join us today, our speakers who were able to join us both virtually as well as in the room, um, Ashley, Robert, Sarah, uh, Drew and Kanti, and all of you uh, who've joined us from home for joining us. I'm so glad that you've been able to share the last hour and a bit with me. I hope to see many of uh, you in person soon. Do take care. Good night and good day.